Hey, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is uh, Carl Melville. I'll be your moderator today for CPA Annuities, How to Strengthen Trust with Your CPG Customers. We have a full house today. A few are still straggling in, but I believe we're going to get started uh, right now. So this is an interesting topic, and it's probably never been more timely than it is uh, right now as uh, this is a, a rare, not a rare, but a valuable commodity, and given the changes in the industry becoming ever more crucial. Today, we're going to hear uh, three success stories from three, uh, oper from three uh, subject matter experts that have taken this uh, combinations of best practices and technologies, and you'll see what they have uh, done with them. So if we can get started, let's look at an agenda. We're going to begin with a little bit of housekeeping, get that out of the way, and then we'll have a number of brief introductions. After that, uh, for the sake of this call, we're going to all agree on what trust is and make a few comments about trust so we all know what we're talking about. And then from the CPA State of the Industry Report 2018, we're going to give a few market trends I think you might find interesting. And we've chosen trends that speak to the merits and necessities of ever increasing levels of trust between CPGs and brands, or excuse me, between brands and uh, and co-packers, co-packagers. Uh, so let's, uh, after that, we'll look at the challenges that uh, our panelists have faced. They've submitted those in advance. We'll take a look at that list. Then we're going to ask you to, uh, in a brief poll, to vote on the challenge that you are having the most issues with in terms of strengthening trust, and we'll share that information with you. After that, we're going to get into three uh, uh, success stories from uh, Johan Pott from Crescent, uh, Stephen Masternak from DHL, and Serge Peladu from Anasha. So I, I really think you'll like these. I got a sneak preview of them yesterday, the final form, and uh, pretty exciting stuff. After that, we're going to do a brief summary and a Q&A. So let's move into that housekeeping if we can, Vicki. By the way, you'll hear me speaking to Vicki, although you won't hear her voice. She's shy, but she's the one that made all this possible. She's one of the secret weapons over there at Newlogy. So this webinar is being recorded, and everyone that is listening to it today and has registered will, will have it mailed to them. Uh, I'd still recommend you take notes because there will be a lot of good content today. There will also be time for Q&A afterwards, as we noted. If you look on your far right, you'll see a question box. In real time, just type in any questions that you have. Among other things, Vicki will be curating those throughout the webinar today, and she'll be giving them to the uh, to the panelists as well as myself, and we will answer as many of them as possible uh, following uh, today's presentations. Also, we're going to give you at the end a brief uh, survey. Actually, I think it'll be mailed to you afterwards. We really encourage you to take a moment and do that so we can continue to improve on these. There will be a series of these Newlogy webinars. I should say there are a series of them. And they're excellent, but they're always looking for ways to improve them, as are we with the, the CPG webinars, excuse me, CPA webinars. Okay, so if we can move on. Yeah, this is where I need to talk about myself, so let's get this out of the way. My name is Carl Melville. Uh, my company, the Melville Group, has been helping contract packages and contract manufacturers grow. That's our mission. We've been doing that for nine years. Uh, we do revenue uh, enhancement, branding exercises, lead gen, media, PR work. We do a lot of web work. Uh, enterprise value work, and then industry research as well as competitive intelligence. I've been doing this for about 25 years and have been with many of the major uh, contract packagers and contract manufacturers in the industry, usually in the role of like VP of marketing. Today I do a lot of speaking and advising and writing on the subject. And I'm also a strategic advisor to the CPA. You'll be hearing more about the CPA today, those of you that aren't members. And I keep an office in Chicago where I'm from and I live in San Diego. So now let's talk about the CPA. And the CPA has been the voice of our industry now for 26 years. It has grown up with the industry. I remember going to one of their first meetings 20 odd years ago, and it was appropriate for the size of the industry then, and it has matured with the industry. It's a, it's a great association. For those of you that aren't members and are on the fence, I, I would encourage you to take a look at it. If you were a member in the past, I would encourage you to take another look because it really adds a lot of value. It's the largest and oldest trade association in the industry, and it is totally focused on the health and growth of our members as well as the entire industry. They invest heavily in member education. There's also a great lead gen program, but members rate the number one takeaway is the networking that they get as well as best practices. They do publish a fair amount of research. We did the 2018 State of the Industry Report, for example, which has been an extremely successful report. It's only been out about two months, 
and we've uh, sold quite a few copies of it. More importantly, we've got a lot of good feedback on it. You can find out more about the CPA and all of this at contractpackaging.org. So if we can move on. Slide, there we go. And I need to talk about Nulogy, the ones that have made all of this possible. If you're not familiar with Nulogy, it's a cloud-based agile platform. It allows customers and it allows the consumer brands to respond with ease and speed to volatile and complex retail in the volatile and complex consumer environment. It is uh, optimized for end-to-end -end contract packaging operations and enhanced collaboration between consumer goods companies and their contract packaging providers. Their solution leverages machine learning and artificial intelligence to drive continuous improvement in the supply chain. That's what they wanted me to tell you, and it's all true. Uh, I will also tell you that I had the benefit of speaking at their annual conference this year, and I've worked with a lot of technology companies over the years. These guys are, are really a class act. I, I, I really admire what they've done, plus they're totally focused on our industry. This is what they do. Next slide, which is another Nulogy slide. They are now a global company. They're on five continents, 12 countries. They're in multiple languages. And again, they're still focused on COPAC in food, beverage, and consumer goods, life sciences. So uh, also they have off to the side here, their tower because they're proud Canadians that they, they can stack pallets up 91,000 CN towers, which I thought was kind of an interesting stat. Vicki, uh, that's it for Nulogy. If we can move on. I want to talk now about trust and then some marketing trends. So we can move into trust. That's a word we throw around, and it's a heavy word, but yet when I ask what it means, I get, I would say, a variety of looks from people and a variety of definitions. So if we can, just for the sake of this call, even if you have a different definition, we're going to lay down some markers. My definition of trust is that it is an assessment that someone makes that someone else will take care of their concerns in the future in a manner that is acceptable to them, whether they're looking or not. It's why we put kids on school buses. It's why we get on airplanes. We believe that someone will take care of our concerns in a way that we find acceptable. And the more that is done, the more trust is built. Again, if you have a different definition, awesome. That's a working one that I use. The purpose of trust is another one that gets people kind of sideways. They get all sorts of rosy reasons about why we want trust. And there's a lot of great reasons. But for me, the business reason for trust is because it lowers the cost of transaction. The more you trust someone, the less structures you have to build around them, the more transparent things are, the more agile you can be, the more you can collaborate together. If you go in the other direction, as you lose trust, costs go to infinity. And what do you say? You say, I can't trust that person or that company, so you can't do business with them. There's always two parties in trust, even when there's multiple parties involved, there's always a two-directional flow of trust. Uh, the components of trust, and you can look this up in the dictionary, there's only three. There is uh, capability. Or, and then dependability, and then sincerity. The first two are your ability to do things and your ability to get them done on time, and those are always situational, right? So you can say, uh, you know, he's, he, he's really good at, uh, at, at providing a lead program, but I wouldn't let him do open heart surgery on me, even if he stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night, But because that's situational. But the third one is the tricky one. That's the one that has to do with sincerity. Once someone lies to you, you know, you, you all domain, all domains. It isn't situational across the board. You don't trust them. But the tricky thing is, and we've all run into this, the customer is the one that gets to decide which of those three you broke. So you could very much be, wow, we messed up on competency here. But the customer is, yeah, that was a sincerity thing. They don't use that word, but it's they feel they were lied to. And now you have a huge problem. And the cost of repair, repairing and rebuilding trust is not insurmountable, but it is never low. And it's usually never the same. So that's a little bit about trust. Everyone has their own definitions. I wanted to set those up so we can move through today. Can we go to the next slide, Vicki? Okay, so this is, uh, a lot of this comes out of, and we're not, we have all like a, a whole two hour thing we do on this, and we're going to do it in five minutes. But this is some of the data that came out of the 2018 State of the Industry Report, and it came out of some of the concerns and trends and drivers that are going on in the industry. And we're going to talk about them from a trust perspective, and then you're going to hear these, these uh, success stories, and you'll be able to see how they are dealing with these issues. The first one that we get a lot is skew and format proliferation. It's a huge problem for brands, uh, yet they feel they have to continue to do it because of marketplace needs. 
and it is rippling through the supply chain. So co-packagers, co-packers are dealing with it in a very big way. Customers' desire for superior quality, whether they're willing to pay for it or not, seems to be a question that goes back and forth. They certainly have a need for it more so than ever, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, customer co-investment. Most of our, uh, of the, we interviewed 120 CEOs of this, by the way, for contract packagers and contract manufacturers. Most of them are of the belief that customer co-investment is going up, but that the new arrangements are much more complicated than they've been in the past. The two-way commitments and the levels of performance that need to be hit. There's also greater in, uh, vendor innovation. This has to do with something we call the 3G effect, which we'll get to, and the waxing and waning of purchasing department influence. There's also a drive towards turnkey, which we'll cover in a moment, and then uh, the desire to have fewer vendors that do more. Now, this has been a 20-year odyssey for brands to do that, but we're actually seeing them now beginning to do that in some real ways. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Vicki, if you could advance the slide. The first one here is relationship structures. Uh, this is one that surprised us when we did our data. Today, about half, actually if we ran it again today, this was about six months ago, it would probably be over 50%, 51%. But the majority of new relationships are coming out in a turnkey model. Uh, tolling as a percent is dropping and cost plus as a percent is dropping like a rock. Uh, most CPCMs we spoke to believe on, when we did interviews that this is a better vehicle for containing the complexity of the relationship. So as these relationships become more and more complex, we're seeing more and more turnkey models and we expect that to continue. Slide. Measuring customer satisfaction, this is something else that's going through a major change and it has a big impact on trust. So I'll cover it here about, there used to be 100%, the way you measure trust is you call up your customer and you say, how we're doing? And the CPG would say, hey, we're doing okay, we need help here. Today, about two thirds of the measurement takes place with much more sophisticated tools. Uh, about 15%, as you can see from that purple uh, slice of pie, is actually technology tools that are being used. But the rest are a variety of tools that are being used. It's because there's so many more players involved, the relationships are so much more complex that in order to manage that trusting relationship and to measure it, uh, much more complex tools are being fielded. Now, this was a big change from a year ago, and I bet a year from now when we redo this, the numbers will be higher. Slide, Vicki. Okay, this excited young woman, is, there it is, is trying to tell us that almost all CPCMs, that's contract packagers and contract manufacturers, now earn well over half their revenue from long-term contracts. Now you might say, whippy, that's great, or you might not care, but here's the deal with that. The churn rate has gone down. This is what our, our data shows us. However, when those churns happen, the holes that are blown in your in your volume is much, much bigger and they're taking longer to replace. So where you might have lost three or four small deals in the past, you may only lose one at the end of a contract, but the hole that it blows in your in your capabilities or in your capacities is uh, is more significant and it's taking longer to fill that. So this is where trust becomes a becomes even more important. These relationships are longer, they're more complex, and at the end, hopefully you're in a position where you'll be able to refill that based on the trust you've built more quickly. So it's having a big impact. It isn't good or bad, it just is. Vicki, next slide. We talked about skew proliferation already, and this cuts across a lot of different areas about trust, and you'll be hearing some of that uh, just a bit from our panelists, but uh, grant, the brands continue to grapple with this, and it is a, it is a great opportunity, but it's also changing the way co-packers work. My favorite uh, poster boy for this is Oreos. When I was a kid, there were four Oreo SKUs. Uh, I haven't had this verified, but I've heard two different people tell me that currently there's about 180 Oreo SKUs. So you can imagine the the havoc that wreaks on supply chains as opposed to turning on machines and letting them run forever. So this is having a big problem. And because you have the relationships are longer lasting and more complex, but the projects are shorter and more intense. So it puts new stresses on trust and your ability to do what you'll do when you say you'll do it. Vicki?
And talk about three trends here. And again, we have the whole sections on this in the report and we have whole presentations we do on this, but very, very briefly, three mega trends that are driving change. The Walmart effect has been going on for what, going on 30 years now and continuing to remake our industry. It's showing no signs of stopping. Uh, I was in the Walmart down the street here the other day and they have just put in the lockers, which a lot of you already have for uh, home store, for home delivery pickup or home pickup rather. Uh, there, all the changes that are rippling across the supply chain. The Amazon effect, much newer. Uh, the brands are still figuring out how to deal with it. Well, what I know for sure about this one, by the way, is that the brands have to have a seat on that bus. They cannot afford not, and I call it the Amazon effect, even though it's all e-commerce. Amazon is getting almost 50 cents on the dollar out of every e-commerce transaction. So it's fair to call it the Amazon effect. But the brands have to have a seat on that bus. They cannot afford not to. So they really need copay. They don't know exactly how the game is going to end yet, and they don't know what success looks like, but they need all the help they can get. And a lot of co-packers are positioning themselves to be in the right position at the right time for this. The uh, 3G effect, uh, again, this was happening long before 3G was on the scene, but the resources available to brands compared to what they had a generation ago, 10 years ago, is significantly more constrained. So they are looking for innovation. They are looking, uh, we spend a lot of time doing innovation shows for contract packagers, contract manufacturers that work with brands because uh, they're looking for all the innovation they can find. And that requires another level of trust as that value chain becomes more complex. Vicki? Lastly, we uh, interviewed uh, CEOs and we said, what are the customer's top five criteria when they work with you? And this is the order they came in and I won't belabor it for time, but I will point out that number two is, of course, cost is always number one, right? But uh, quality safety has always been important, but with everyone having a, uh, you know, a, a video in their back pocket, the telephone uh, that they can post on YouTube, the, uh, the need for, and the level of risk involved and the level of trust required is higher than it has ever been. So, uh, and trust can apply to every one of these in a pretty big way. Vicki? Now we're gonna talk very briefly about the challenge of strengthening trust. Vicki, go to the next slide. This is actually from our panelists today, who you'll be hearing from in just a moment. We asked them to, uh, not to rank, but to list the challenges that they face when they're strengthening trust. And they'll speak about these in their case in their case histories here in just a moment. But as you can see, and I'm, I'm going to go over these and then we're going to ask you to uh, take a moment and list your, out of this list, which one you are having the biggest challenge with. The SKU problem that we talked about, uh, which is our, you know, I'm sorry, KPI, uh, KPI problems are in inconsistencies or is the SKU proliferation, is it, uh, product and package complexity, and that's slightly different from skew proliferation, then we have uh, just, there just isn't enough time for all the things we need to do to build trust. Then it's the recovery. When there is a breakdown, you know, we're spending a lot, it's a huge challenge for us when something goes wrong to get back to ground zero, or is it just an overall lack of visibility and transparency? Vicki is going to bring up the uh, poll, and if we can take a few seconds and vote on that. Just pick the item that you feel is your biggest challenge. Okay, Vicki, if we have enough respondents yet, go ahead and show that data. If you feel you need to wait a little longer, go ahead. Okay, I didn't see those numbers come up, Vicki, so if you get those, uh, we can bring those up perhaps at the end. Let's uh, let's keep going. Let's move into the next slide here. Oh, here we go. All right, folks. Well, we'll look, we have a, just about a three-way tie, so everyone agrees skew proliferation is a problem. None of us have enough time, and boy, it takes a lot of time to recover from breakdowns. Our panelists will touch on all of these within their individual success stories, so it'll be interesting to hear how they deal with this and uh, perhaps it'll give you some uh, some ideas to take back. Vicki, can we move on here? We 
You may be having a little lag here today, folks, so um, bear with us just a moment. And now I would like to uh, introduce Johan Pott from Crescent, and he has a pretty exciting story he'd like to share with us. Johan? Thank you, Carl. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Johan with uh, Crescent. A little bit about Crescent. We were the uh, 2018... Uh, oh, next slide, Vicky. Thank you, Vicky. We were the 2018 Newlogy PacStar Quality Excellence Award recipient. Uh, as such, what we're talking about here over the next few minutes we'll have a fairly heavy focus on the quality the quality aspect and how it's important in strengthening trust with our customers. Crescent was founded in 1850. We're a fifth generation uh, family health company. We focus strictly on contract packaging uh, as our sole core competency. Uh, we're in seven operating sites in four states with about 1500 employees. And our mission is really to focus on building trust and delivering value through competitive and customized solutions that are engineered to meet our customers' growing needs. We developed a strategy uh, that resulted in a leadership playbook that we call the Crescent Way. And we'll spend a fair amount of time kind of delving into that just high level. Uh, the Crescent Way is probably best described as a mindset for how we think about service delivery uh, for our customers. Uh, next slide, Vicki. So the Crescent way, uh, as you can see it here, is it's about doing it right, doing it safe, and doing it well. That'll be kind of the recurring theme here for Crescent as we talk about strengthening trust. And it relies on Newlogy to enhance our service, performance, and results. It's our methodology, uh, our brand, to guarantee high-quality service by aligning our three Ps, purpose, process, and people. And the Crescent way protects our brand as well as the customer's brand. RSW, or do it right, do it safe, do it well, is now the way that we get stuff done. So there was intentionality behind those words with doing it right, referring to quality, doing it safe speaks for itself, and doing it well is all about efficiencies and productivity. And all three of these do's, they represent a commitment to improving our customer's competitive advantage. Uh, next slide, Vicki. So in reviewing our successes this past year, you know, we saw the same five core components time and again as contributing to how we strengthen trust with our CPG customer base. And we clearly saw the three do's in quality, safety, and technology, and that were bookended by, as you can see, a strategy and our culture. So just to kind of go through each of these and, and give you some, some insight as to what it meant to Crescent. So first was how we had taken the time to develop a detailed company strategy that was modeled after the three Ps of purpose, process, and people. Now strategies are uh, commonplace, obviously, with successful organizations. They're modeled after different structures. The purpose, process, and people model fit us very well. So all three of the P's are aligned to guarantee high quality service performance. So purpose, which is the what, you know, it's defining our customers and our company's true needs and our commitment to performance and quality. Process represents the how. So it's how we deliver high performing service and how we deliver performance and quality. And then lastly, people, the most important part, the most important resource. It's the who. So these, uh, who delivers on our customers' needs by delivering performance and quality. So the strategy naturally emphasized the very first of the three do's, which is quality, or do it right. Now, what was important to us is that we made quality central to our purpose, which is our very reason for our existence. So if you were to look at our playbook today, you'd see that our purpose is defined as we exist to improve our customers' quality and competitive advantage in their markets. Very simple, very clear and to the point. So this is the definition of our purpose statement and we share it with customers, but just as importantly, we share it with our people. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but this is how we integrate quality into our culture. So next, and as the second of the three do's is safety or do it safe. 
So in addition to openly sharing all safety KPIs, we ensure that customers' physical products are safe. So safe during inbounding and receiving, with secured yards, uh, personnel, safe in storage, safe throughout the production cycle as we report damages and scrap and cycle count data, and also safe during shipments, which means that we ensure we ship the right finished goods to the correct destinations on time. So in short, we ensure that each customer knows and believes that their brand is safe with us. So technology represents the third of the three do's, do it right, and Pack Manager and QCloud are powerful tools that help our people deliver on these high quality standards that enable full transparency, and they really are the key drivers for an overall positive brand experience. Pack Manager and QCloud enable Crescent to provide real-time information on demand, but as well as weekly or monthly for our customer meetings. And they also serve as the driving force behind our continuous improvement initiatives, like increasing total company process accuracy to 99.7% in 2017. So then lastly here, number five, all of this rolls up into the most powerful driving force of all, which is our culture. And the development and rollout of our strategy actually highlighted a key deficiency in our business when we first set out on this journey. And that was our culture. It had to change. So we had to transform our culture into one that drives and rewards people to adopt the Crescent way as we had defined it and as it, we had delivered it to become our mindset, the way to get stuff done, if you will. So uh, needless to say, um, anytime you're talking about a culture transformation, that is a journey. And we started it almost two years ago now. Uh, it's one that will continue for many years to come. And as we like to say around here, we're a long way from where we ultimately want to get to, but we've made positive strides that have resulted in strengthening our trust and collaboration with our CPG customers. Next slide, please. So the benefits of what this all means to, obviously to us, but certainly to our customers of, of strengthening trust for Crescent. I think first and foremost, the positive impact that it's had on Crescent service culture can't be underestimated. Um, with the, the recent uh, labor forces and the different areas that we're pulling from and making sure that our plants are, are staffed and have the right resources, uh, having the ability to use our culture, to use the Crescent way, to use it to recruit, attract, hire, and retain and recognize talent has been tremendous. The other benefit of strengthening trust for Crescent is that quality becomes a lot more than just a set of rules, just a, a set of layered audits. It becomes a mindset. Uh, this also goes back to the culture once again, uh, because, of course, it does not happen overnight. Uh, but it has been uh, tremendous to see the improvements that have come out of each of our plants as a result of strengthening trust. Now, the other thing it's done for Crescent is that it's allowed us to reinvest in the Crescent way, not just to protect, but also to grow our brand, and more importantly, our customers' brands. Uh, next to last here is that a tremendous benefit has been preferred customer consideration for new or expanded operations. As everybody knows on the call, when new business is uh, available as an opportunity, uh, this is a time when showcasing what you've done internally through your culture, uh, through the Crescent Way and tools like that uh, really collects on the rewards of those benefits. Last but not least, um, we've had the opportunity and the encouragement from some of our customers, and it's really been an indirect outcome of customer trust, is their encouragement to invest in social responsibility. And one such indirect outcome is Crescent Cares, which we launched uh, almost almost two years ago now, and uh, has really been a, a secondary benefit of how this impacts our people and our culture uh, as we live out the values that we claim are important to us. So Crescent Cares, uh, we have a partnership with Childhood Food Solutions uh, using Crescent people, Crescent facilities, equipment to assemble food sacks uh, to, to battle uh, childhood food insecurity. It's used for disaster relief engagement, uh, local food drives, and in generally just positively impact the community 
in which we work and live. And uh, that's that's it for the Crescent success story. Thank you, and Vicky, back to you. Excellent, Johan. Thank you very much. That's an exciting culture story, too. I really love that. Now we have uh, up next is uh, Stephen Masternak from DHL, who has some, uh, I would say, from a different perspective, another very exciting story to share with us. Stephen? Steve? Thank you, Carl. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Let me give you a quick overview of DHL. Uh, DHL supply chain is most commonly known for the logistics service that we provide to our customers all across the globe. Uh, we employ over 150,000 people globally and over 40,000 in North America alone. Uh, we're the world's largest secondary packaging provider with 40 sites in the U.S., seven locations in Canada, and 106 sites additionally in the rest of the world. Our goal is to assist customers in the process of getting their products to the market in the most effective and efficient manner possible. Let's take a look at our location in Brantford. We've been operating in our Brantford facility since 2005, uh, and it has grown, grown to 110 DHL employees and up to 350 seasonal staff per day. We create promotional products for our customer, and we ship those products to all of Canada from the one single location. My name is Steve Masternak. I'm the general manager of the Brantford site and have overall responsibility for the packaging operation, which includes fulfillment and materials management, focusing on delivering the business, enhancing synergies with our customer, reducing costs, and creating streamlined processes. I led the implementation of Pack Manager back in December of 2012, uh, and it's been instrumental in, in uh, properly managing our inventory levels, handling product recalls, and tracking production efficiencies. One of our largest challenges is the small footprint in which our packaging operation exists in Brantford. Having a reliable system like Pack Manager eliminates waste in our processes, increasing quality, productivity, and most importantly for us at this facility, capacity. We managed to increase our capacity by 35% on a consistent basis, which allowed our customer to consolidate the entire packaging for Canada into one location without the expense of expanding the operational space. So let's talk about how we made this journey possible. As Carl stated earlier, one of the major challenges in packaging is the variability, the, the proliferation, the complexity of packaging, which makes it, which makes delivering on our customer promise a consistent challenge. Uh, trust is built over time, and studies have shown that it takes 12 positive experiences to negate one negative experience. People always remember the things that they don't like. Not being able to deliver on our promise breaks down trust quickly and takes a very long time to reestablish that trust. So having reliable systems in place is critical to improving our customer relationships. Our lean objectives is simple. Reduce or eliminate waste whenever and wherever possible. By using our lean tools and staying disciplined to the process, our customers experienced higher than expected sales along with increased quality and safety results. Using team building and organizational skills, we've managed to change the culture of our team uh, in, into one that strives to over exceed on a regular basis and treats the customer's business like it's their own. The attitude was imperative in successfully implementing Pack Manager and establishing new productivity standards and expectations, pushing the company into new areas of growth. With the management team and our associates, we've created an environment that consistently overachieves and continuously improves through innovation and dedication. Let's have a look at some of the results. So using Pack Manager's WMS capabilities and its productivity reporting tools, We've made strides in improving in our ability to deliver the business. We're now in our fourth consecutive year of delivering 100% of all customers' products to stores on time and have been able to significantly reduce the amount of materials on hand. Having visibility into production requirements, ordered materials, and material statuses, we can make better business decisions to drive speed to market while reducing cost. Basically, less order lead time for materials and increased predictability of production output has enabled better speed to market for our customer's product. So what was the overall impact of this? Of course, the main goal in in-contract packaging environment is to renew the business with your customers. Our Brantford site has been successful at renewing for the fourth consecutive time. And the biggest driver to the renewal is the trust that's been developed by consistently delivering on our promise to the customers. By doing what you say you're going to do, when you say you're going to do it, and for the price you said you would do it for, trust in the relationship is built and it starts to turn into a true partnership. 
The partnership we created has led to the consolidation of the Canadian business into one location, increasing volume by 25%. Uh, it also allowed for partnered innovation ideas that led to us being able to produce 15% of uh, all of our materials on site just in time. Uh, and we're looking to increase that to about 45% in the next three years. It's also led to new business opportunities with our customer that we did not think was in scope before, but they had asked us to uh, pursue. The success of our operation led to our customer recognizing Pack Manager as the solution for all of its North American business across its seven locations in, uh, in the US and Canada. Being awarded the Strategic Partner Award from Newlogy was really great recognition and validation to the partnership that we created between uh, ourselves and our customers. And using that, we continue to find ways to improve and innovate in conjunction with Newlogy and our customers. Thanks very much. I will pass it back to Carl. Thank you very much, Steve. That was excellent. Uh, brought up a lot of questions too. Hopefully we'll get some in the question box here in a moment. We have uh, our next speaker is uh, Serge Pelladu uh, from Anasha, and uh, I think he's going to come at, going to come at this from yet another angle. So uh, Serge, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, Carl. Uh, welcome, everyone. A um, little bit about Menasha. Um, Menasha was founded in 1849, privately owned seventh generation company. Uh, currently have two divisions, the Orbis division, uh, which manufactures plastic containers uh, and other plastic products, uh, as well as Menasha packaging, uh, concentrating on the co-pack and the corrugating side of the business. Uh, the packaging division operates out of 50 facilities across North America, 11 of which are in Canada, and uh, nine of these facilities use Newlogy's uh, pack manager in Canada, and we have also implemented 19 sites in the U.S. Uh, over the last few years. We hire 5,200 full-time employees and over 8,000 associates on a, on a daily basis work at uh, any of our facilities in the packaging industry. Health and safety, quality and innovation are at the heart of everything that we do at Menasha. A little bit about me, I'm Senior Operations Manager uh, for Menasha Packaging. I've been in with the business 13 years uh, in the contract packaging, and I was in charge of leading uh, all the nine implementations, including two uh, new openings for the Canadian facilities. Moving on to the next slide. Um, Menasha came to Canada and acquired two companies to strengthen their position. They came to Canada with one of our biggest customer, uh, Unilever, uh, who um, Carl mentioned a little earlier that you know, customers are, tr are, are trying to find uh, less and less vendors and want to make sure that they deal with one particular vendor. So they wanted to go in North America. So they, they came to establish themselves uh, in Canada and also acquired two new companies, one company specializing in Corgit and the other company specializing in contract packaging. Uh, when Menasha first entered in Canadian market, there were several challenges because there's three companies trying to work uh, together and they're all working on their different system, different processes. So there was a challenge for the first year to integrate and see which systems we were going to use to best suit our the business. So uh, everyone was talking different language. There was no possibility of moving uh, work from one facility to another uh, because we would have had to reset all the, uh, the all the customer base into the new system. So uh, we had to come with solution and very fast. Moving on to the next slide, uh, that solution was uh, was basically converting all Canadian facilities onto Pack Manager over a 15 months period. Uh, there was a lot of challenge. Our ISS team was in the US and we're also implementing some uh, pack manager uh, into their facilities in the US. So uh, we had a great team coming up and helping us uh, do the Canadian facilities over a 15 month period. The benefits, uh, I was talking about uh, the flexibility of moving people from site to site because they no longer needed to learn um, other systems. So we were all operating under one system and also uh, the biggest benefit was the U.S. support that we could get uh, since all our uh, U.S. teams uh, were uh, fluent in pack managers so they could come and help us spe uh, specifically on new openings of sites. 
Uh, also, another benefit was standardization in our labor quoting. Uh, again, three different ways uh, of working, three different processes. Uh, customers from one facility to another uh, quotes were not the same. So it gave us the opportunity to also align with the U.S. pricing because we are now uh, we now have uh, over six six of our customers are North American. So we needed to standardize uh, that as well. And also the data being centralized uh, so we can use information, uh, like I said, between the U.S. and Canada. Next slide, Vicky. One of our biggest uh, success stories at Panasha uh, was uh, for sure our Unilever uh, customer that we onboarded a few years ago. Um, and Neulogy was a big part of this uh, uh, with the Unilever integration where Unilever went from 13 co-packers and over 50 vendors to only one, that being Menasha. One of the key contrib contributors for Unilever awarding the full turnkey business to Menasha was around uh, what we're offering in terms of our traceability system and processes. A little history about that is back in 2008, uh, the Strive, uh, Strive Group, which was Menasha Legacy Company, uh, implemented the first ma uh, pack manager system in the Alberto Culver facility. A few years later, in 2010, Unilever acquired that company, planning to integrate the Unilever model in that facility. But after reviewing our processes and what our pack manager was able to offer, chose to build the rest of their co-packing business around that model. Um, on the next slide, we can see a few of the achievements uh, that we were able to accomplish. Carl mentioned a little earlier uh, what the top uh, five customer criteria were, and this customer was no different. They were looking for total cost saving, speed to market, as well as simplification, all of which we were able, uh, able to achieve in a short period of time with the support of our, our Neulogy partner. So on a closing note, I'd like to, uh, uh, all these great improvements were made possible with uh, the support of our Neulogy partners and uh, also uh, the great Menasha ISS team that's been awarded the uh, MVP award last May. So congratulations to all and thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, th th thank you for that, Johan. That was excellent. Excuse me, Serge. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. That was uh, that was really helpful. I like the way you tied that together at the end too. We've got some questions coming into the box here, but I think we have Vicky. We have a summary of uh, of our platforms here. Okay, thank you. Here we go. I, the system was running slow. Here we go. So, in closing, for those of you that are not familiar with, uh, that are not yet familiar with Neulogy, and I know there's a mix of folks on the phone today, but we've just covered three diverse business cases and customer situations, and each of them expressed in their own way how they benefit from higher levels of trust, both between them and the brand and the CPG, and how that trust needs to flow both ways. Uh, because you have to count on the customer being able to do what they'll say they'll do when they're going to do it so that you can deliver what you need to for them. So it definitely flows both ways. Uh, and it also requires a level of communication that is much more onerous than it was in the past. So using technology to improve, by the way, if you just automate a mess, you end up with a faster mess. But by going in with smart technology tools, you can do things that were simply impossible a few years ago. For example, we wouldn't be able to hold this webinar a few years ago. So th this is what the Neulogy platform is focused on. And while there are many out there that are in the SaaS area, theirs is totally focused on the uh, on the uh, uh, Copac business. So we've heard from a lot of our presenters today about this platform and how they've enabled trust with their customers. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Neulogy, uh, they're holding these little mini webinars that are, are really neat because they just go in there. They don't take a big time commitment. You go in, you know what the topic is. Uh, they cover it. So it's tell them what you tell them, tell them what you told them. They're, they're very straightforward. Uh, I've seen some of the outlines from them. I'm looking forward to sitting in on them myself. If you go to uh, newology.com slash mini webinar series, and that's hyphenated, 
uh, I believe uh, you can check them out there. Also, I'm going to ask Vicki if she wouldn't mind to email all the attendees uh, that link as well. So that's a little bit of our uh, summary here today. Oh, there it is. There's the URL right on the screen. Excuse me. So, uh, Vicki, do we have any questions coming in yet? I know we have a few here. Uh, let's see. This one actually is for Johan, but it would probably be appropriate for all three of you guys if you'd like to comment on it. Uh, Johan, will start with you because this is who the, they asked for. But if we could comment on how do you communicate the need for trust, communication, and collaboration throughout your organization internally, through your culture, which you talked about at Great Lake, how do you communicate and how do you keep it fresh? That's a good question. I, I think uh, the most honest answer is that's a work in, in process. I think we'll, for starters, as part of um, our stepped up efforts around recruiting people at, at all levels of the organization, from line workers to forklift operators, line leaders, production supervisors, administration, project managers, and right up to the executive suite. Um, we spend a lot of time formalizing that onboarding process. So whereas really not all that long ago, we did not have a lot to offer from that standpoint. People were quite commonly uh, hired, briefly onboarded, thrown into the role. And quite frankly, uh, as the business continued to grow and expand, uh, when you do that, you, um, you end up with um, a mix of results. And we had some, in all honesty, some painful results as we we ended up with, with operating models that resembled more uh, of a very autonomous looking structure that, uh, so say for instance, um, you ended up with a, a new plant manager at one of our new operations. And rather than understanding this is all pre-Crescent Way, uh, we ended up with the, um, the John Way or the Sue Way or the Jack Way or whatever it might have been. And it created distortion. It created... Um, uh, communication problems, but most importantly, it almost immediately damaged trust that we had with this, in these cases, new customers. So what we've done to address that and to communicate the importance of trust, we've revamped that onboarding process. We've established uh, playbooks. Uh, we've got something called the Crescent Way playbook. We've got the Crescent Safety playbook. Uh, each playbook comes with uh, videos that we've produced. Uh, that accompany all of the literature pieces, and we now take our time. So um, as as part of onboarding um, new people into Crescent, uh, there are mentor roles established. There are customer visits set up, supplier visits as part of the on onboarding process. And these books, these playbooks that we have now, uh, are just terrific guides. We've, we've written them ourselves. They've been proofed a number of ways. Uh, we've already begun and started on uh, editing them because as we continue to grow and and drive new business, um, that happens. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop it there, but that onboarding process and formalizing it and developing tools has been key for us. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Steven or Serge, do you have anything you'd like to add to that or uh, expound on that? Yeah, actually, uh, I'd have to echo what Johan said about uh, the culture. It all starts with a culture, and it, it does take a long time to build that. Um, you do have to work at it. It is always a work in process. Um, but the more open you can be and the more trusting you can have, the more total employee involvement that you can generate from your people. Uh, there's a lot of superstars that, that everybody has working for them, and sometimes you just have to really tap into that potential to get it. Uh, and, you know, the customer recognizes that when they can walk on the floor and they can talk to the people and um, the, the reaction on the customer's face when they see how passionate the staff is to work on their business for them, it gives them that sense of, um, of trust that I, I trust that this is going to get done. I trust that they're doing what they say they're going to do. Uh, and it, it really does. It, re it really is beneficial for everybody, but it does take a long time to build. Good point. Thank you. Uh, Serge, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to echo what Steve and, and Johan said, but the uh, culture is really key. I mean, I've said it before, we were three companies that tried to merge into one a few years ago, and we were really struggling with that uh, with that culture uh, where we all 
uh, speak in uh, with the same voice. Uh, that's very critical in, uh, in front of the customers. So there were some a lot of struggles on that. That we live in a fast-paced environment, and onboarding is not necessarily the first thing that comes to mind. We just want to make things happen and and deliver uh, to the customer. But uh, it is a critical piece. Uh, we were lucky enough to have a we have a like i mentioned a little earlier and a, a team that's dedicated for the pack manager training uh that was probably one of our uh key things that we had for menasha which we had a dedicated team that spend really time so at least for that portion of the business we were good but uh, we're working on on our onboarding processes as well and making sure that everybody speaks the same language and we all go towards uh, the same direction. Okay, excellent. Thank you. That was an internally focused question. I thought those answers were great. We have a, a lot of energy around an externally focused one now. People are asking, you know, what, what do you mean by the 3G effect? I'm going to answer that briefly just to clarify it, but then I'd like you guys to weigh in on how it's impacting your businesses because there's a lot of energy here around it. Uh, I think there's three questions, four questions on it. So we call it the, the 3G effect. It's been happening long before 3G was on the scene, and it's simply the ongoing constant reduction in costs as the mature brands who are under incredible earnings pressure look for ways to cut costs, and some of what they cut isn't necessarily fat. Some of it is bone and muscle. So a lot of the resources that they used to have internally, they're now looking to their value chain for. And you guys are three valued vendors in various parts of those value chains for those vendors. Uh, how are you seeing this play itself out? Any of you can take that. I, I, can, I can give a few thoughts here. Um, I think just just generally speaking, um, not over generalizing, but the the 3G effect impacts our, our most important resource the most, and that's our our people support group. So the way we see that manifested within our customer base is um, is either the reduction of overhead uh, changes in the structures and organizations that we correspond with uh, primarily on a daily basis and changes in those positions may or may not be backfilled. If they're backfilled, um, they're uh, new resources. Uh, quite often, they are uh, resources that don't have the depth of experience uh, and training. Uh, and in those cases, what we see is um, an increased drain on the resources that we have to in part educate, uh, to in part you know, help uh, help those uh, new team members familiarize and acclimate to the to the business relationship. So that's one of them. On the other hand, where it creates a vacuum and potentially um, another individual is, is required to pick up multiple roles, uh, that in and of itself can lead to even greater uh, concerns. And it's you know it's where if that individual might be overextended or that a team might be overextended extended by the the requirements of of executing the business, which means things can fall through the cracks. Uh, not every um, proverbial T is is crossed or I's dotted, and then it might create um, you know rush patterns. Now, it's we do see it as an opportunity as well, because what it means to an organ organizations like like DHL, Manash, and Crescent, I think, and I can speak for all three of us. You know, we do like having the opportunity to b become of more value. To these organizations so we do recognize that those moves are important they may be necessary in order for the cpg customer to remain competitive in their market and as i mentioned earlier that is crafted into our purpose statement you know to grant them and to ensure that they maintain that competitive advantage so uh, not a necessarily a menu of options here to pick from when it comes to how we address that uh, but through the, having the right people going back to culture going back to people that all three of us have touched on you know, making sure that we have um, the culture in place that allows our people in full transparency, in trust, to voice to our management teams and say, well, th this is what's happened. I, this is where I need support. Here's where we may need to redirect. So it does kind of come back for us to people and culture. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Uh, uh, Steve or uh, Serge, anything you'd like to add to that? We've got a couple minutes left here. I think that was a, a, a great explanation uh, by Johan. Um, I, I will say that uh, 
in order to really try to combat these as well with the way that it's that that the business is evolving is to, you do have to have this trusting relationship with your customer because a lot of times where we're finding now that we can provide value is not necessarily in the space they've asked us to play but it's more in managing and looking at their upstream business and their processes and helping them find ways that uh, that we can jointly eliminate and sometimes it's with activities that don't even involve what we're uh, what we're focusing on in in the copac uh, but more of the upstream generation of that work or the the sourcing of things or even transportation uh, items um, but with with the the way that it's going you have to have a trusting customer you have to have that relationship and, and have built it otherwise um, it's like putting up walls there's no there's no receptive com uh, communication there's no um, production uh, productive talks that actually happen if they just put up a wall and they say that's my business you don't know what you're talking about but the more that you can build that trust and, and earn it then you can actually work together to try to provide even more value than what we currently bring Excellent. Thank you. Well, hey, I want to honor our time commitment. So we have one more question here that it's from Steve or for Steve. It's about your pellet program. There seems to be a lot of interest. Uh, but before I ask that question, anyone that needs to or would like to drop off, I want to thank you so much for your attendance today. You'll be getting a copy of this uh, webinar and please take advantage of that survey question. It means a lot to us. For those of you that want to hang on for the uh, for the pellet question for Steve, uh, please do so because I know there's several folks interested in that. So thank you uh, to everyone very much. Steve, this question is, uh, can you discuss the pellet reduction program in a little more detail? Was this just for improving planning or was it also to help reduce your customer's uh, safety stock as well? Absolutely, thanks Carl. Um, it was actually both. What was happening was we had a very high level of inventory uh, because our customer was operating in uh, all of their brands operated in silos they, they never talked to each other um, their design teams designed based on individual requirements um, so you would have the, the same type of display across um, three different brands and they'd all be using unique individual part identifiers uh, and it became uh, very difficult to manage so there's a lot of things that went uh, hand in hand with it, which uh, standardized colors, um, you know, depending on the keep your brand color, but aligning the brands to um, to different to to make sure that we're all on the same page. So, for example, there was at one point we actually found that there was 16 different blues that became the standard branding, and it became uh, unmanageable and very expensive. So what we said was, hey, let's get it down to two blues. We got the brands to align to it. Um, let's start making common parts. Let's design the displays using uh, much more common integrated uh, designs so that we can, if one doesn't execute, we can swap with another. So that was kind of the start of the process. Um, the other thing that was really critical that, that Newlogy helped with was being able to link the materials together and not, um, not keeping them on an island like they were. So once you know what parts you have, you can start ordering based on the part requirement you need rather than ordering for the finished display or, or finished unit that you're going to produce. We managed to drive down our SKU count from 5,000 unique SKUs to just over 2,000. Um, we do have a goal to actually reduce our number even further from what it is. We, uh, we need to get it down to about another 55%. And that's why we've started doing a lot more production uh, just in time. So it literally, we produce the corrugate inside the facility rather than ordering it from the vendor. Uh, the reason for that is typical customer lead time is a heck of a lot less than what your corrugate vendors uh, have. So your corrugate vendor would look at three, four, five weeks to deliver, customer wants it in three days. How can you line those two things up? So it was really also working with the vendors to have um, on your, your fast moving, your everyday available SKUs to make sure that your vendors are holding the materials, not bringing them in house, agreeing on min max levels. Um, it was a lot of conjoined work that we did, not just with our customer, but also with our customers' vendors that we were being directed to purchase from. Um, and really seeing the levels drop, seeing this, this program that we put in place work, um, it could not have been it could not have happened without the, the level of, of trust and partnership that we created. 
Um, it was daily meetings, daily communication. It was support from our customer to push their vendors to where they needed to be, um, to basically tell the, the, the vendors, you need to do what they're saying. This is, we're on the same page. I'm aligned to these goals. Um, it improved quality. Uh, it improved speed to market, um, setting up lots of, of standard deliveries when things are expected, when they're not expected. Um, we actually were managed to reduce NPI from levels that were about, uh, I think four years ago, we were about uh, $2 million in, in NPI a year that was being scrapped. Uh, we're just closing out, or sorry, last year when we, we just closed out last year, uh, and we were just above the $600,000 mark. So it was a huge decrease in that level as well. Still not where we want to get. The goal is zero, uh, but we're actively working towards it. It was a, a very big program, but when, you, when you're looking at your on-hand materials, you need to look at why you have it, what else can I use, what else can I do with it if I can't use it for that, and then uh, the world's moving to just in time, so we need to start pushing our external vendors to start being more just in time. Um, you, you can get something in Amazon same day now if you order it. Well, it shouldn't take me four weeks to get anything. So we need to get on the same page with how that happens. And really getting our customers to understand that was, was critical in driving this down. Excellent. It was a great narrative on that program. Thank you. Uh, well, guys, we are flat out of time. So uh, a couple of things. One is a best practice, if I can recommend that. If you heard anyone that you liked today and you would like to keep that fresh in your mind, please reach out to any of our panelists or me on LinkedIn. I know I will accept the link and I'm sure they would as well. One more thing on LinkedIn, Newlogy runs an awesome group there as does uh, the Seat Contract Packaging Association. That one has over 4,000 members, all of whom care greatly about the subject. So if you're a brand or a CPG or a uh, COPAC, I'd recommend it. So I wanna thank everyone one more time for all of their uh, great, uh, uh, participation today and that's also goes to our attendees we had a full house this was really good and uh, look forward to seeing uh, you all on, on another one whether I'm in the audience or speaking so thank you very much and with that I think we'll adjourn it gentlemen do you have any uh, any last things otherwise I think we're done I think we're okay. good all right guys thanks a lot thank you everybody thank you